I'm Georgia Asher, a Woodstock Land Conservancy board member, and I want to welcome you to this evening's webinar on ecological gardening with Karen Ursula Edmondson. We're grateful that technology has allowed us to bring this program to you in these unique times and that you can view it from the safety of your own home. Tonight's presentation, Designing Gardens from Nature, offers an opportunity to learn about creating beautiful gardens that additionally support biodiversity and the local food web, unlike many of our traditional gardens. This webinar is part of our Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Project, which we launched last month to encourage community members to enhance pollinator habitat on their own property while sharing the information with neighbors to do the same. By the end of the summer, we hope to have a map showing pollinator habitat and their connectivity across our community. You can join the project by doing two things. First, create pollinator habitat in your own yard if you haven't done so already. And second, go to our webpage, the Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Project. You'll see it at some point during this webinar on the screen. Click the Join Pathway button and fill out just a short form. It's free. And your property will appear on our map without its address, and that's to preserve your privacy. You can also buy one of these six inch metal signs to put on your property. Just imagine driving through our community and seeing corridors of these signs. Wouldn't that be great? The Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Project is brought to you not only by the Woodstock Land Conservancy, but also by Woodstock Transition, the Woodstock Environmental Commission, and the Catskill Center. We seek to address the sharp decline in pollinators that we've seen recently. They are important and key to supporting our food web. Events like this one, and those we're planning over the next few months, cost money. So your contributions are greatly appreciated, even if they're just small ones, five, like five or $10. Donate online at woodstocklandconservancy.org. But please note on your donation that this donation is for the Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Project. Okay, now to our webinar. Karen Edmondson received a Master of Science degree in landscape design from Columbia University. Since 2008, she's, she and her team have been designing, installing, and managing Catskill Gardens for humans, birds, bees, bugs, and butterflies. Enjoy this presentation. You'll be able to ask questions during it by tapping the chat button on the screen and writing your questions. These will be answered at the program's end. Now, I want to warmly welcome Karen. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Ursula Edmondson and it is so nice to be here with you all tonight talking about pollinators and gardens. First, I'd like to thank Georgia for reaching out to me and Ellie and Maxanne for helping to put this together and to Joan for moderating. And Georgia has asked me to let everyone know, all the webinar participants know that um, the handouts will be emailed to you in the coming days. Okay, bear with me a second here. Okay, so uh, working with nature, designing, designing from nature, working with native plants, excuse me while I just move my little thing up here. Okay, um, so um, thank you, Georgia, again for that introduction. Um, I have, this is gonna be the 12th year that I've been um, in business, uh, designing, installing and managing Catskill Gardens. And it was about six years ago that a new client came to me and um, asked me to create a garden for birds. And his site was basically half an acre of clay and hard pan. It was three, three tiers of seven foot boulder retaining walls 
and clay and hard pan, about half an acre, in a in a semi in an amphitheater, right? That um, surrounded the house halfway, and it was that project and his request that got me thinking about gardens and landscapes in a new way, in an ecological manner, using uh, m the majority of native plants. So that's where the journey began. And we are here tonight now to talk about pollinators. And when most people talk about pollinators, they talk about or think about the really cute and fuzzy ones, right? Like the bumblebee or the native bee or the butterfly. But I'm gonna ask us all to think about all pollinators, bees, honeybees, solitary species, native bees, bumblebees, pollen wasps, ants, flies that everyone kills, flies are pollinators, bee flies, hoverflies and mosquitoes, lepidopterans, both butterflies and moths and flower beetles. So keep that in mind when we're thinking about pollinators. And as for ecological horticulture and ecological landscaping, maybe many of you haven't heard of this new term. Um, it is a real practice and it does exist. And there is even a ecological landscaping association of which I am a member. So ecological horticulture is essentially gardening with the bigger picture of the environment in mind and making sure that garden and landscape works for humans as well as the wildlife and microorganisms that rely on it. It's designing, installing, and managing gardens for humans, birds, bees, bugs, and butterflies. It's the whole picture. Now, don't worry about taking notes on this. This is this list here is part of your handouts and which will be emailed to you in the coming days. Um, we're gonna be uh, going over many of these points in this presentation. And I'm just gonna read through it really quickly. Uh, eco gardening for the home gardener. Really the best thing and the first thing you can do is never use a pesticide or an herbicide ever. There really is never an op a, a reason to do so. Plant native plants, mostly straight species plants for best pollen and nectar production. Now, why straight species? Because a lot of the cultivars that you see, and I'm gonna use the echidacea, the coneflower as an example, there's a gazillion colors, and now there's a couple of different shapes. You have those sort of little round button, and then the double button um, looks like a cupcake. And when plants are bred and overbred and rebred and bred again, a lot of times the pollen and the nectar content goes down. So they're not of much use to pollinators. That's why um, ecological gardening suggests get the straight species, get the pink or purple coneflower. Magnus is an acceptable cultivar. With yarrow, use the white yarrow as opposed to the orange, as opposed to the pink, as opposed to the yellow. Try and get the straight species. It's better for the pollinators. Also plant a smorgasbord of native plants right, for early, mid, and late season food. Early meaning early spring, willows, pussy willows. Mid season is pretty easy to do, and then late season. So the early and the late season, you really kind of have to focus on. Plant in layers. What are layers? They're the ground cover layer, the seasonal interest layer, and the structural layer. And we'll get, get into this later a little in more depth. But um, in nature, you can just look at a succession from from a grassy field to the shrubland to a forest, right? Those are the layers. There's usually very little bare ground in nature. She covers all of her earth. Uh, utilize naturally occurring weedy plants. We're gonna dive into this later too. Mullins, um, jewel weeds, uh, asters, goldenrod. They're considered weedy by a lot of gardeners or homeowners, but these are the plants that are really of high value to pollinators and they're also free, which is good for you and your pocketbook. Uh, plant early season, willow, spice bush, and late season, asters, goldenrod, witch hazel for pollen and nectar. Plant milkweeds, plant mountain mint, plant goldenrod, plant aster. Stop mowing. Allow part of your lawn to grow out so that the clovers, the dandelions, and the wild thymes can make a comeback. Again, these plants are out there they're probably in your lawn right now, but you keep mowing them. And so they never have a chance to grow and thrive. And um, the bees, the pollinators love these little, these little ground hugging plants. 
mow less often. If you're going to mow, if you're going to keep mowing a patch, which is totally cool, mow instead of every week, mow every two weeks, every three weeks. Also, mow at times when pollinators are not out pollinating to avoid running them over and killing them with the mower. This is usually uh, in the early morning or later evening. Uh, they're usually very active during the mid-morning and um, later in the afternoon. Uh, we were out at a uh, project uh, at a garden in Shandaken once and there was a row of lavender there and I would make sure to get there before the sun hit that lavender because once it did it was just full of bees and I left that lavender alone for me and for them. So go easy with the mulch. Do not strand mulch. I mean do not strand plants in seas of mulch, right? Mulch is not considered a ground cover layer and we'll get into that more later. Mulch is really effective for when you first put a plant in after installation for conserving water and squelching weeds. But the idea is to um, break yourself of the mulch habit by using those ground cover plants and those weedy plants and meadow plants to create that natural ground cover for you. Plant native shrubs for bird habitat, nesting sites. Plant ornamental grasses for food and cover for ground nesting birds. Buy from local nurseries and ask them about their pesticide and neonic policy. Avoid buying plants at big box stores, which tend to purchase their plants from giant uh, wholesale nurseries that very often still use some sort of aside. Most local nurseries I deal with do not use any pesticides. Plant for moths too. Moths are pollinators too. Just because we go to bed at night doesn't mean the pollination stops. Don't use blowers, sound and air pollution, and leave the leaves. Okay, so what are native plants? Native plants are plants that have been living for many years in certain climate and soil conditions and with insects, birds, and mammals. The plants and critters are part of a balanced community, a web of life. Native plants are part of a functioning and balanced ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their environment. So some of the key words here are community, web, interacting, you know, that's a big part of the ecological gardening and gardening with native, with, with native plants. Here's an example, birds and butterflies, a food web. This was taken from the book uh, by landscape architect, Carolyn Summers called Designing Gardens with the Flora of the American East. One of your hand, handouts is gonna be a bibliography with numerous books for you to purchase should you be interested, hers is on there. So it's a really simple um, explanation here. You can plant an oak tree and Doug Tallamy uh, references this in, his, in one of his books too. A native oak tree sustains a little bit over 500 species of caterpillars while a calorie pear, which is very often planted in the traditional landscape field. You can still buy them at certain nurseries. Calorie pears sustain one caterpillar and that's the lonely poor little inchworm. Not that there's anything wrong with the inchworm, but still you want the oak tree, you want those 500 species of caterpillars. Why? If you want birds in your garden, you're gonna want that oak tree because those mama and papa birds, once they have babies, they're gonna be out looking for insects to feed their young. If you don't have the caterpillars, you won't have the birds. Again, that to show the interconnectivity. Here's a couple of photos of meadow community of native plants that enjoy full sun. We've all seen these before, right? Driving around, you've got your asters, you've got your goldenrods, you've got your prairie grasses, on the shorter end of things, your clovers, your self heels, your bird foot trefoil. Here's a forest community of native plants, shade lovers. You have your um, mountain laurels at the bottom, there's hemlocks, there's beech trees. Some of you might have the sun, some of you might have the shade. You can do a native garden with both. Shade, um, there's a lot you can do with shade. Why are native plants important? Native plants have co-evolved with the insects, birds and mammals to offer food and habitat. So when you garden with native flora, you automatically sustain indigenous fauna, including pollinators. Native plants are used to the fluctuations in moisture and temperature. Therefore, they survive drought and other extreme weather better than when you garden with more traditional or foreign exotic plants. So when you use the native plants, you're also being kind to your bank account because you won't be replacing dead plants as often. However, there is a caveat with that and that is called climate chaos right now. And you know, if we have three months of no rain in the summer, then 
the native plant will suffer too and will need supplemental watering. But in, um, in a typical year, in a typical season, those native plants, because they're from this area, they are better adjusted to surviving the fluctuations, the, the wet, the, the super cold in the winter up in zone four, which is where I am, or usually in Ju July, we've gone about three weeks with no rain. They're good with that, because why? They're used to that. Why does all of this matter? We are all connected on this planet, and when we are kind to the earth and other species who live on this earth, we are actually being kind to ourselves. There's a circle of life. Native plants and native insects are deeply dependent on one another, and pollinators need both larval host plants and nectar plants. Example, specialist bees emerge from their nests at the same time their host plants begin to flower. Let that sink in for a little bit. Specialist bees emerge from their nests, they just know when to do so by a miracle of nature at the same time that their host plants begin to flower. So if you don't have that flower, you're not gonna be able to sustain that bee. Vice versa, if the flower's there and the bee's not there, very often those flowers that are pollinated are pollinated by the specialist bees. So you kind of need to have both. It also matters because habitat destruction, climate change, sterile suburban landscapes, pesticides and herbicides are stressing insect, bee and bird populations. The good news is as, as gardeners and homeowners, we can definitely help. You all know that already, you're part of the uh, Woodstock Pollinator Pathways. William Young, who's a landscape architect and restoration ecologist and wetland scientist, he said, we bring in the plants. We never bring in the animals in, in, and insects. And I've seen that firsthand on job sites where we start planting mountain mints. We're gonna be talking a lot about mountain mints. When we put the mountain mints in, all of a sudden there are bees everywhere. And to the point where the homeowners email me and say, Karen, we suddenly have bees. I'm like, yes, that's the mountain mint. So like, if you plant it, they will come. Like that baseball movie. If you build it, they will come. Uh, and you have and plant larval host plants and nectar plants. We'll be going over that shortly too. And nature knows what to do. So you're just going to be giving her a little assistance by planting those native plants and by practicing ecological horticulture. And also the, the last reason and um, a really great reason is native plants are beautiful. So in these three photos here on the left, you have Allium millennium and you have Echinacea purpurea, and it looks like some sort of sedge grass there and more meadow grasses in the back. A beautiful combination, which is two plants. And in the center, you have the ferns and you have the oak leaf hydrangeas and a beautiful staircase. You don't need much more, you know? And in the right-hand photo, you have Simisifuga, looks like black magic or hillside black. And then you have the echinacea in the front and looks like a Carl Forrester grass in the back background. So, you, so with minimal plants, um, and massing, which is a design feature, you can create a beautiful, evocative native landscape that's beautiful for you and um, functions as a food source and life support for pollinators. Here's another example. This is a woodland Maine edge garden, Matthew Cunningham des landscape design. I believe he is based up in Maine. If he's not in Maine, he's in Boston, but he's somewhere not in New York state. Um, and it's ferns, it looks like hay-scented ferns, and low bush blueberry and spruce, and high bush blueberry, it looks like too, and a beautiful, a beautiful granite walkway. Again, another example of native plants in drifts and massing, and a simple hardscape feature. This is the conifer garden at Flying Trillium Nature Preserve. Carolyn Sumner, she's a landscape architect. Um, near Tarrytown, New York. Uh, that center sh uh, shrub is a gold cone juniper and it is a native juniper. And it's, we use it a lot as vertical accents in the garden because it is just so stunning. If you're trying to recreate an Italian garden, maybe with those, um, I forget the name of the uh, trees use, the, the ones in um, Italy that are so beautiful and so that look like this, you can use the gold cone juniper. Uh, Catskill Native Nursery has this a lot. We source a lot from Catskill Native Nursery and it's, and it's a great um, evergreen, a great conifer. 
Here's an example of a meadow garden by Larry Wiener Landscape Associates. Again, simple. You have your stone wall, stone stairs, and you have a simple mown path through this meadow and a vine. Simple elements, and it creates a really beautiful place that um, makes me want to go out and walk into that meadow. Foundation plantings for your house. This is Catskill Native Nursery, Diane Greenberg and Francis Groders. Um, several native plants here, all native. We have the heucher at the bottom. You have the bottle brush buckeye, which is that beautiful shrub with the white airy flowers. It looks like they have a, a red bud and a dogwood tree in the back. And there's your bee balm and your black-eyed Susans. And notice here how you don't see any mulch. The mulch might be there a little bit underneath, but the plants are very densely planted in layers. You have your ground cover layer and your mid layer and then your shrub and tree layer in the back to really create a dense, beautiful planting that's a pollinator heaven and very aesthetically appealing. Perennial beds, Piet Udolf, he designed the High Line. Um, he's a master of the new perennial movement where he uses a lot of perennials. <laughs> and here you have Joe Pie Weed, which is the purple, the tall purple guy in the back. Um, and then some ornamental grasses. I don't quite know what those little blue flowers are in the front, but um, just beautiful, the sweeps and the massing of native plants, very evocative. You can go formal too. This is a um, formal uh, garden by Nelson Bird and Waltz, landscape architects. Um, looks like they use a lot of echinacea here. And, and it's a very, you know, it's a designed um, formal uh, garden uh, with the wildish aspect of the native plants, which is very beautiful. And notice to the left of the stone wall, there is again the mown path, and then you have a meadow. So it's that contrast between the formality and the wildness. It's really beautiful. River birches, all birch trees, the paper birch, the white birch, the river birch, the yellow birch, I'm missing one, maybe the black birch, they host numerous moth larvae. So you, if you don't have birch trees in your landscape and you have a large enough landscape, um, consider planting some. Here again is a more formal application. They use it as a grove and a pathway. And that silvery plant in the foreground of the photo on the top right, that's mountain mint. That's a super pollinator attractant. There'll be more photos of that later. Plant a lot of mountain mint. Here's a meadow foundation planting that we did. Um, this will be the third year. This was so this was three years ago. It was containerized uh, grasses and uh, perennials and then we ran they're not in yet, but we ran um, sedge, sedges underneath and around all those to form, eventually form the mulch layer, a natural green mulch of grasses. So that's what it looked like at installation, placing on the right photo as placement, in the center photo that's after placement. And then this is what it looked like two years later. So that yellow shrub in the foreground is shrubby St. John's wort, available at Catskill Native Nursery and Gallows thus far. And it is an amazing plant for sun. If you have full sun and kind of dry, poor soil, get this plant. It is deer resistant. And when those yellow flowers bloom, the pollinators, all sorts of pollinators, butterflies and bees and wasps, there and flies, they're all over this plant. And the deer don't eat that. This is like amazing. Something that other than boxwood or barberry that the deer don't eat, right? And then you have the bee balm in the background and there's mountain mints in there too. This, this in the middle of July when we go there and you stand really quietly, you can hear the buzzing of the bees. It's beautiful. This is another view of that same garden. This is on uh, West Saugerties Road. You see the drifts of the bee balm, the purple bee balm throughout and then the silvery plants are the mountain mints. So we ran the bee balm and the mountain mints with our, which are both in the mint family around the clump forming grasses and the shrubs to again, fill in that mid layer, that mid level layer of, I don't know if I'd call those like a mulch layer but it is a ground cover layer for sure. They're just taller. You can also have a very formal pool 
in ground pool and use native plants in your pool planting design, like the Joe Pye weed, that is the purple guy on the left there, again by Matthew Cunningham, who did that main garden. This is a pool planting we did for a client in Willow, which is a mix of hydrangeas, because really hydrangeas, to me, it epitomizes summer. And then we ran um, sweet fern, which is that ferny, low mid-sized plant next to you to the left of the hydrangea in the foreground. And then you had the north wind grass, native grass in it. So it's a mixture. You can do mixture. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to be 100% native plants, not by any means. Mix and match. You can also do art, garden art installations. This is my friend Mel Ballar of Zone 4 Landscapes and Andes. He and his wife, Peg, did a formal circular spiral garden and filled it with native plants. Beautiful, right? Here's a close-up detail of Mel's garden and Mel's cat. And in the photo on the left, the, the bottom plant is blue zinger, sedge, and then you have autumn bride heuchera. And then it looks like sea oats and other grasses in the back, but all native plants in a very formal application. So they're very versatile. Using native plants is gardening with nature, for nature. Uh, you conserve water because once plants are established to the climate and the natural changes in temperature, they will, um, you don't need to water them basically. We don't, we have never installed a sprinkler system in any of our gardens. And after that first year of installation, after installation, once you put a plant in the ground for that first year afterwards, you do have to stay on top of watering native or not so that the roots established. We have not gone in and watered any of those gardens after that um, because they're native. And we'll get to the root systems later on. They have massively deep root systems. So they pull water from really deep down in the ground so they can withstand the drought a lot better than the lawn grasses for sure. And then plants with shorter roots. Native plants, when you're planting a community of native plants, you create a fluid, a fluid dynamic system that changes and develops and grows with minimal input from you or the garden crew that you hire to maintain this. Uh, right now in a lot of our meadow gardens, we're, go we're going in and we're pulling stuff out. We're editing, we, we hardly do we put anything in anymore. It's mostly editing. And we have an abundance of things like mountain mint and bee balm, and then we just transplant to other places. We also give back habitat and nourishment to the earth and the other life forms who live here. And we support insect populations, native bees and honeybees too. Honeybees are not native, they're an import from Europe. So this is the perfect example, providing life with milkweed, um, you know, milkweed and monarchs, that symbiotic, very close interdependent relationship. Uh, the milkweed leaves are the only food source for the monarch caterpillars. So milkweed is a larval host plant for monarch cal caterpillars. If you don't have milkweed, you won't have the monarch larvae, you will not have the monarch butterfly. That's how that goes. Monarchs and milkweeds have co-evolved. Perfect example. Here's a, a depiction of that. You have the, the caterpillar laying the eggs on the milkweed and then the pupa and eventually you have the butterfly. But if you don't have those larval host plants, um, you won't have as much of an abundance of the, of the adult insects, of the adult pollinators. This is the common milkweed growing on the sides of the road, uh, beautifully scented. It smells like jasmine to me at least. And uh, they're extremely hardy because um, they're growing in a patch across the road from where I live. And every year that patch gets salted to death in the winter and the plow comes by and still these milkweed spread and grow. So they need full sun and they like moist, not wet swampy standing water, but they like moist, moist soil. Beautiful. Here's another rose milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. Pink, not round, the flowers. It's more of a flat shape, flat top. Uh, the scent isn't as strong, but still good uh, milk um, monarch attractant. And in the, the kind of blurry photo, I apologize on the right, this is from my first project actually, where we put in a field, a slope of 400 day lilies. And then after a few years, the rose milkweed popped up and we left her and she's been beautiful. And in the background, you can see mullen, which is also considered a common weed, right? Mullen, 
for Bascom Thapsus. Um, but here, because of the scale of this garden, it was a very large garden which, with a large sweeping slope of the daylilies, we weeded out a lot of the mullen and kept a few in key strategic locations like here, you see them, there's a better photo later on. But um, so, so we kept the weeds as part of this design. The homeowner loved it because it was free and, and he kind of got that we were going for Alice in Wonderland and mullen also attracts both short and long tongue bees. So it is a pollinator plant. This is not milkweed. This was taken in my garden last August, September during the monarch migration. And this is spearmint, spearmint patch. Uh, I can count about five of them here, but there were literally about 10 monarchs on the mint patch on their way down south. So anything in the mint family is um, a boon to pollinators. So native bees, there's 4,377 bees native to North America. 800 specifically to the East Coast. Honeybees are domesticated bees and native to Europe. Not that there's anything wrong with honeybees, but a lot of people are always thinking of honeybees when they think of bees and pollinators, but it's the wild bees that are native wild bees that really need our help. No one is allergic to native bees. Yellow jackets are not bees, they're wasps. Uh, native bees are usually solitary mothers or live in small groups. They don't defend flowers and they are typically not aggressive. As with, other, as with other pollinators, native bees are in decline due to pesticide, invasive species, chronic mowing, fall garden cleanups, deer and open country landscapes in decline under development pressure. So they need our help. Native plants are essential to native bees. Native bee sizes and shapes are lock and key to native plants. For example, tongue lengths vary in bees and the uh, long tongues need long tube flowers like penstemon and short tongues need short tube flowers like sunflowers. So again, you have the interlocking, interlocking interdependent relationship there. Uh, peas, bees live on pollen, so you want native pollen producing flowers. A quarter acre can support native bees if planted correctly. Native plant biodiversity equals native bee biodiversity. And if you want more intro, info, there's a link here. All of the links that I picture in this presentation, by the way, are on your ha handouts as well. So you don't need to rush to write this down. Sam Droge is the um, national bee expert. He's amazing. He's with the Xerxes Society and the US Geological Survey as well. And he, and he has a Facebook page. Find him on Facebook. So the specialist bees versus the generalist bees. Most bees can be separated into two categories, specialist or generalist. The 20% of the bee population is specialist. And again, they have evolved a specific relationship with, the, with a few or even just one plant. Some specialist bees forage for pollen that can be found on one plant species. Flowers in the aster, goldenrod, and sunflower family are among the most frequently recorded as being visited by specialist bees. Again, flowers in the aster, goldenrod, and sunflower family. This is not my saying this. This is Sam Droge, the bee expert, saying this. So asters and goldenrods, yes, they're kind of common, but there's not just one type of aster. They're not just one type of goldenrod. There's many different types, many different flower sizes, shapes, leaf colors. So you can, you can actually plant a garden of aster goldenrods and sunflowers and have a really beautiful garden. And they're considered weedy, but, but really they're not. Look at them in a new light now, Sam Droge. Then on the other side of the spectrum, generalist bees, about 80% of the bee population are less picky about the flowers they visit. They visit a wide range of flower types and species when seeking out pollen. Here is the Southern Plains bumblebee on a pale purple coneflower. This pale purple coneflower prefers more dry soil. Typically the Echinacea purpurea, the straight pink purple coneflower likes it a little more moist. This guy likes it more dry, uh, available through Catskill Native Nursery. <clears throat> so here's a couple of bees. And again, this is just a summation of a link that, that you have to the um, attracting pollinators from the US Forest Service. Uh, there's 47 different species of bumblebees. The leaf cutter bee cuts out part of leaves to make her nest. 
I've listed a flower for each of the bees here. It's pretty fascinating. This is only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much information on bees out there. And again, your handouts will have several links that you can go and you can read to your heart's contents about bees. So biodiversity attracts bees, clovers, meadow grasses, wildflowers. The more species of plants you have, the more species of bees. Biodiversity, variety of native plants to attract generalists and specialists. Bloom succession, again, early, mid, and late. Don't do the fall cleanup. Leave the dead plant stalks standing to provide winter homes for native bees. Do remove leaves around home, homes, structures, garages, things like that, and clear leaves off walkways for safety, but leave them everywhere else. And some showy native perennials that attract native bees, spiders, butterflies, beetles, or coneflower, joe pieweed, bee balm, mountain mints, cup plant, goldenrod, and asters. Joe pieweed again, tall. I'm almost six foot tall. This plant is about seven, eight foot tall in one garden in Chichester. But there's a little Joe cultivar. He only gets four foot tall. So if you have a smaller garden, get the little Joe pieweed. This is a picture pulled back of that same arrangement. So we have the bee bomb there. We have the Joe pieweed. We have a summer wine nine bark. And we have a couple of um, red twig dogwoods. Moths. Moths are definitely pollinators too. And here is a plant that I found at Catskill Native Nurseries called Starry Campion. What a name, Starry Campion. Silene stellata is the Latin that is pollinated by moths. And um, interestingly enough, a restoration ecologists and landscape architects are using a new method called TRVA. It's called Terrestrial Rapid Bioassessment, where they basically use moths as an indicator of the health of an ecosystem. Who knew? So look at moths now in a new light. If you have a lot of them bomb, you know, sky bombing you at night um, and uh, fluttering around your outdoor lights in summer, this is good news. Don't consider them past, they're beautiful. That means you have a healthy landscape and garden. You can also attract moths with night blooming plants that that flower at dusk. Evening primrose is one example. There are cultivars of evening primrose. I don't know how um, sustainable they are with their pollen and nectar production, but the weedy one that's growing kind of naturally, that's a perfect plant. If you find her popping up in your garden, keep her, evening primrose. Also plants, perennials and shrubs that have, that have flowers that stay open 24 hours, that the flowers don't close up at night. There's a lot of them. Carolina allspice is one of them, Calicanthus floridus. Uh, she likes part shade, part sun, and moist soil. Uh, Catskill Native has one growing along a small stream bank in their nursery. It's absolutely beautiful. Zone five, I would not plant in zone four. I would not plant this by me. It's too cold the winters. So the good news about a lot of these perennials I'm going to show you is that they do not only attract bees, but they attract a whole host of pollinators. Um, butterflies, hummingbirds, hummingbird moths, skippers. Um, usually the cobalt, which is the one on the left, is the one that you see everywhere at all garden centers, but there are about five different um, blazing stars that work in the Catskills. The photo on the right is rough blazing star, and it has little round buttons as opposed to the long stem. It's beautiful. Bee balm. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with bee balm. This is the Jacob Klein, which blooms before the raspberry wine. It attracts bumblebees, moths, hummingbird moths, hummingbird butterflies. This is a nice combination for those of you who like hot, hot, bright garden, bee balm and liatris for the hot pink and the hot purple. Two other monardas, two other bee bombs. Uh, we have the fistulosa on the left, the purple, the bergamot, and the bradburnia on the right. They both prefer drier situations in full sun. The um, bergamot can grow about three to four foot tall, while the bradburnia is only around two feet tall. It's another photo of the bergamot and the mountain mint. The mountain mint is on your lower right hand corner. It is that silvery foliage. Mountain mints do have flowers, obviously, but for us gardeners, for us humans, 
we appreciate the silvery fo foliage, which is also scented and deer do not eat mountain mints. Uh, excuse me, one garden in Saugerties, we did bee balm and mountain mint together in a bed near to a place where the deer hang out. And because usually the deer don't eat the bee balm too much, boy, were we wrong. They came in and decimated the bee balm, but they didn't touch the mountain mint. So here's another deer resistant plant that's wonderful for pollinators, mountain mints. Bee balms, two different planting combinations. You have your summer wine nine bark with the dark leaves and the bee balm, the raspberry wine. And then on the left, you have the black eyed Susan, the more light, hot, light hearted combination. This interesting plant, Rattlesnake Master, uh, very architectural, kind of unusual, but it is available at Catskill Native Nursery. And it also comes in a lot of seed mixes um, from um, ecological seed, online seed places like Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon Nursery. So, so this little plant here, this is all the, this is a listing of, of some of the um, pollinators that attracts bumblebees, yellow face bees, multiple beetles, um, 11 different types of wasps. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And a moth, two different moths, host plant for two different moths. So this is definitely one that you want to have in your garden, both for the pollinators and also because it's very kind of Jetsons-y and space agey. It's very unusual. The stem and the flower might look really tough, but it's not. If you're going to walk around it in your garden or do work around it or, or, or go and say hi to it, be very careful because the stem is actually very fragile and just brushing up against it with my tools hanging out my side, I've broken several stems and it's awful. It's just awful and heartbreaking. You do not want to do that. Here's a couple more shots of the rattlesnake master in a garden. Great for contemporary gardens and contemporary um, architecture. It is a member of the carrot family. And some of you know, dill, queen Anne's lace. Um, what's that other one? Fennel. Pollinators love these plants. Dill, queen Anne's lace, fennel. Uh, it's especially, they're especially good for um, as larval hosts. Caterpillars eat them, eat them probably right down to the nub too. So plant a lot of dill. A lot of fennel. Uh, echinacea, again, straight species. Just go for the straight species. Look at this in a massed planting like this. It's really stunning and beautiful. Here's another photo of it. Again, the hydrangea, which is definitely not native, planted with some coneflower, really beautiful. In the back, that shrub with the purpley leaf is smokebush, grace, Catinus cagigria grace. Cone flower attracts butterflies and bees. And then in the winter, she provides seeds for non-migratory birds. Another photo, meadow planting. Uh, this actually was, we didn't, um, we planted this, but from seed. Uh, all of these plants came up from seed. We did not put in any plugs or containerized plants. We got the seed from uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. They have uh, several different types of specialized seed lists. I better hurry this up here. Um, these are the root systems of prairie plants. Now you see how very deep they are. The lawn grass, the turf grass, is the one all the way over on the left. Everybody else is feet down, three, four, five, six feet. That is why you want native prairie plants and grasses in your garden. Very drought tolerant. Coneflower for dry sites. The pale purple uh, coneflower likes more moist. These two like drier sites. Pale purple and bushes. Penstemon, again, the long tongue bees like the penstemon, foxglove beer tongue. You have the straight species white and you have the purple on the left. Anise hyssop, everybody loves anise hyssop and the deer don't eat anise hyssop either. In zone four, which is down around by Woodstock, this guy will self-sow. By me, I have one plant. I have only ever had one plant. It does not self-sow because it's too cold. Spice, spice bush, for all of you forsythia lovers, don't ever plant forsythia again. Plant spice bush. Blooms earlier than forsythia. It's a host plant for the spice, spice bush swallowtail butterfly. And when you get um, more than one plant, because they're male and female, then they create berries and you're feeding birds later in the season. Host plant, it's wonderful. Spice bush, likes part shade and wet to moist soils. Summer sweet, here's another one. This is good for moths as well because the flowers stay open year um, overnight. Uh, summer sweet, 
uh, likes uh, moist soil in shade, it can handle shade. If you're gonna put it in full sun, make sure that the ground is moist continuously. You can even put her in some swampy situations. Oops. Okay, so native roses, they're so tough. They're so drought tolerant once established. They create habitat and food for birds. They spread, but they're not invasive. They have a scent. They have a beautiful old fashioned rose scent. By super duper extra tough, I mean that uh, we, we planted some in uh, September once and I watered for the September and October. Then the winter came. And then the next year, the next spring, we had a drought. I did not go back and supplemental water. And not only did these roses survive, they were spreading even in drought. They are super reliable, super tough. This is the prickly wild rose. No one's gonna get near that. The Virginia rose, commonly available, most nurseries to six foot tall and wide, hardy to zone four. The foliage is used by leaf cutter bees. Flowers attract pollinators, provide nesting habitat cover for birds, rose hips for birds and for you. Excellent source of vitamin C, rose hips. It's really a great shrub. Two other of my favorite shrubs. On the left is the shrubby St. John's wort that you saw earlier. And then on the right is sweet fern, which is another native, they're both native. The shrubby St. John's wort is a cultivar, but sweet fern is just straight species. And um, they, they're both deer resistant. And the sweet fern is a larval host for a wide variety of moths, amazing. We, a sweet fern was one of the plants we put around the pool planting there with the hydrangeas. So it's up to that as well. Here's the St. John's wort on the left hand bottom and the sweet fern on the lower right. Looks like a fern. Ornamental grasses are native ornamental grasses, not miscanthus. Miscanthus can tend to be invasive in zone five and warmer. Um, ornamental grasses provide food and habitat, shelter and nesting sites for ground nesting birds. It's heat, drought, cold tolerant once established. The only thing you need to, you need to do is in spring, cut them back. It's windproof, deer proof, dog urine tolerant, and beautiful texture. And here's a couple of my favorite Cloud Nine. Those of you who love Miscanthus, Fine Line, Gracilomus, uh, plant this instead. Cloud Nine, Thunder Cloud is another good cultivar. Indian grass kind of looks like Carl Forrester, except Indian grass is native, and Indian grass self sows, which we like because we like to pull things out instead of putting things in. Saves time and money. Little blue stem, north wind, little blue stem on the left with that beautiful red fall color and north wind on the right with the yellow fall color. This is an example of them. The photo on the right is blurry. Again, I apologize. It was right after installation. The cameras were not as good back then as they are now. And on the left is the garden in the spring, early spring established. Great vertical accent, north wind, widely available. Two more examples of the, there's a sweet fern. The left photo is the installation photo, sweet fern and the little, little short plants in the line of the north wind. And this is two to three years later, everything's filled in completely. The sweet fern is loving this hot, dry poolside location so much that we have to go and prune her back from the pathway. Another detail of the beauty of ornamental grasses. Just stunning and so low maintenance. And those, seed those seeds provide food for birds in autumn and winter. So how do you incorporate natives in your garden? Um, site inventory, get to know your garden. Um, is it sunny? Is it shady? Is it wet? Is it dry? Do you have a lot of wind or are you very sheltered? And all of this leads to the right plant in the right place. If you remember nothing else from tonight, it's right plant in right place. Work with what you have. If you have moss already, do the moss garden. Do not try and put a lawn there. On the other hand, if you have hot, dry sun, try a meadow, why not? Or ornamental grasses as a base for your garden. Prairie Moon Nursery has excellent mixes. Again, it's gonna be on your handout, seed mixes. Shade, ferns, work with them. Don't fight it, saves you time and money. They obviously wanna be there. Uh, this is that site I was telling you about, the, uh, the, the, where the client wanted the garden for birds. This was what we were dealing with on the upper right-hand corner, clay and hard pan and boulders. And again, blurry photos, I apologize, but um, this is what it looked like a year. The bottom with the um, black-eyed Susan was a year after installation from seed mix. 
they're a pioneer species. If you're going to be planting seeds, you're going to have the first year, you're going to have a lot of black eyed Susans. And then the second year, you're going to have foxglove beer tongues. And then the third year, you're going to have echinaceas. Not all plants come out at the same time from seeds. You have to be patient. Here's another photo of this project before on the left and three years after on the right. There's actually people up there. There's my team up there on the photo on the left. Mixing it up, I mentioned before, you don't have to be a native plant purist. If you have traditional garden plants, great, they're beautiful. Uh, stick some native plants in. Here we have bee balm amidst the roseanne geranium and the fleece flower, and we also have the orange butterfly weed, which is great. Cottage garden, again, mix of traditional peonies and nepeta and ladies mantle, and then we put in that gold cone juniper, which is the lime green guy in the center, and you have a couple of um, little uh, prairie drop seed grasses and a north wind and a nine bark. You can totally mix it up like that. More pictures of the cottage garden. This is up in Hunter, zone four. The pool again, different angle. So we used, you know, a lot of traditional uh, landscapes plants here. We used the hydrangea, we used a field of the hot, blooming hot colored daylilies back there, hemerocallis, and then we also incorporated natives. So you can do both. Basic design principles, the right place, right plant, layers, massing, color, structure, focal point, repetition, and progression. Progression, same garden, spring at left, July at right. So it's the progression of the flowers and the color schemes to keep in mind. You don't want this. This is what I'm talking about. There is absolutely no relationship here between any of these plants and there's way too much mulch. There is nothing here. There are no layers. There's no connected system. The layers are absent here. This is what you want to model your garden after. Those, those layers, the ground cover, and then the perennials, and then the small shrubs, and then the medium-sized shrub, and then the large shrub, and then the short tree, and then the tall tree. Layers. Again, another layer. See how everything is covered? You have the grasses, the little short ground cover, whatever it is on the bottom, then you have the very beautiful flowering plants in the middle, and then on the top you have the larger perennials and you have your trees and shrubs. But all ground is covered. Oops. Massing. Piet Udolf, again, just using a lot of the same plant in sweeps. Very effective. Again, three different plants here. Allium millennium, coneflower, and ornamental grasses. That's all you need for this beautiful garden. You have dark paint, I would use bold colors, hot colors, bright colors to uh, contrast and be visible against the paint. Light paint, uh, if you have light paint with pastels, you go for the light colors, the pinks and the purples and the whites. This is the, these two are uh, bright colors, sedums and the phlox, and these are blooming in April when there are no leaves yet on the trees, these, these will bloom. Structure. Notice the boxwood at the foreground really formally pruned tightly. Everything else is a wild, beautiful explosion. And it's the contrast between the clipped boxwoods and the wildness behind that makes this so appealing. More examples of structure, hardscaping, great for structure, walls, pathways, arbors in summer and in winter. If you have privet, cut it back to the ground, let it grow again, and then start shearing and shaping and topiarying and make that privet a beautiful uh, formal background for your wilder plants in front. Again, use what you got. Winter interest, conifers, hardscaping. This is out, this is Mel's place out in Andes. The weeping conifer, the fence, the arbor, the gold cone juniper is the upright one there. Weedy plants that make good gardening companions, mullein, staghorn, sumac, Virginia creeper, jewelweed, yarrow, milkweed, the golden rods and asters again. This is that site. We're gonna be working. You see the staghorn sumacs right in the middle there. We're gonna be, we're gonna be working with them. We are not removing them. We will be shaping them and editing them, but they stay. They wanna be there, they stay. And why? They provide late winter food for our bird friends. And beauty for us. I mean, what's more beautiful than a staghorn sumac in the middle of winter? Here we go again, another example of the mullen. You know, we edited out most of them. There were a lot more than these. We left these three kind of like garden sentinels. Free plant works well. Pollinators love them. 
that's I'm six foot tall. That plant is eight foot tall. Really cool. Not a lot of things are taller than me. And here's a bee, a bumblebee on the mullein flower. So, and if you have a smaller garden, just keep one mullein. You don't need three of them, keep one. Jewelweed. Most of you or, or a lot of you probably have this, just pull them out, keep some, the hummingbird, it's wonderful. Virginia creeper, we've all seen them growing up telephone poles and across the wires. I admire her gumption. Uh, if you have her, use her to your advantage and train her up some stairs or stone wall or over an arbor. She provides uh, berries for the birds and not poisonous, five leaves, not three. Poison ivy has three leaves, this is five. Yarrow, white is the native one. Attracts butterflies, wasps, flies, and bees. Again, here I would go with the straight species. And um, if you are gonna plant colored yarrow, just monitor them and observe them and, and watch uh, how often the pollinators land on the cultivars as opposed to the white. In this photo, notice that both bee, bees are on the white, not the pink or the yellow. Goldenrod and asters, we've all seen this. Um, we've all seen this thriving around in the Catskills. Beautiful, this is a garden in and of itself. This is a pollinator heaven. So goldenrods, Catskill Native Nursery has a lot of them. Those um, Prairie Moon Nurseries online has many of them. Here's some examples of the goldenrods. Goldenrods do not cause aller allergies because their pollen is heavy and thick and not airborne. It is the ragweed that causes um, allergies in the autumn. I know I'm one of them. Feel as those allergy sufferers. Don't blame the goldenrod. Here's some more mountain mints. Love the mountain mints. Here, look at all. We have a, a couple of the hoverflies and, and, and the butterfly on the mountain mints. It's wonderful. And again, deer resistant. Get your hands on some mountain mint. Asters. Asters come in pink, blue, purple, white. Absolutely beautiful. Asters, goldenrod, and black eyed Susan. Beautiful combination with some sweet fern in there. Pagoda dogwood for the birds. This was a young one that we planted. Uh, Doug Tallamy, the, uh, the biologist, reported 20 different bird species on his pagoda dogwood. A couple of birds that come to the pagoda dogwood. Native trees and shrubs important to species, to um, specialist bees, willow, redbud, dogwood, winterberry. A lot of you probably have dogwoods, willows. They're ubiquitous. Keep them, work with them. Service berry is another beautiful plant. If you have a very small garden and you're looking to put one tree, small tree or shrub in, put the service berry in. You have three seasons of insect interest, early bloom, early spring flowers. The berries for you and the birds, good luck trying to get to the berries. The birds usually get them first. And then the beautiful autumn color. Here she is in the woods, just stunning. Look for her, soon she'll be blooming like this. Bees and neonics. Um, 14 are approved for use in New York State. You know, ask your nursery, just ask your nursery and your seed sources all the time. Buy plants that are neonic free. This goes back to never ever using any herbicide or insecticide. This is what a mass marketed complete insect killer looks like. This is from Bayer. Also all major pesticide manufacturers, Monsanto, Bayer, Syngenta, all test on dogs and cats. Last year, you might remember that Dow AgroScience got caught testing on beagles. Another reason not to use any chemicals because not only are the bees harmed, but these poor animals are harmed. Mo less. This, I love this cartoon. It sums it up completely, right? Um, you stop mowing, this, this is what's going to happen on the right. A couple of photos, the photo, the large photo on the left, um, mow a pathway. If you have a field like this, mow a pathway. Or this, this field provides cover for um, deers that are birthing and baby deers. And the photo on the right is actually my property. And it's a mow strip that I didn't mow that just appeared there and is full of pollinators. It's oregano, it's thyme, it's goldenrod, it's clover, it's full. So, so I mow part of my road frontage to look you know, to keep up appearances, but then I also leave a wild patch for the pollinators. It seems to be working. This is what happens when 
you stop mowing, clovers come back. So there's a whole world of life in a garden, garden for them all. And a big shout out to Catskill Native Nursery, who's been a huge inspiration for me. They were really, they've been here over 20 years. They were the four runners, four fathers and mothers of the native plant movement in the Catskill Mountains. If you haven't been there yet, I urge you to go take a visit, but call first now because of the COVID-19. They're not sure about when they're gonna open, uh, but they might be setting up online ordering too. So check back with them on that. And thank you all so very much. This is not a native tree. This is a palm tree out in um, Venice I, that I hugged many years ago. Thank you so much for, um, for being here with me tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Let me find some questions. Um, Anne says, we don't do fall cleanup. I recently read we should wait until temperatures are consistently about 50 night and day to do spring cleanup. Is this accurate? Yes, absolutely. Um, we stopped doing uh, fall cleanups years ago, um, like before everything got, you know, before the information got out there. And um, so we're gonna be going out this spring again and um, when we can. And uh, I always wait till it's warmer. You know, like this March is a perfect example. We had all those warm days in the beginning of March and I saw people posting about doing cleanups already. No, 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 no. We wait, so wait, definitely wait. And then, um, and then when you do uh, cut back things, uh, cut them back to 18 inches from the ground because this still leaves part of the dead stalk remaining there because you want those dead stalks, excuse me, because they're hollow now for the native bees. You notice those, all those native bee houses that you can make or buy, why buy them? Just leave your dead stalk standing over winter and then just cut them down to 18 inches from the ground so you have them there. You have a free native bee house in your garden by, by gardening ecologically. Judith asks, should I discontinue cedar oil treatments for tick and mosquito control? I'm not sure about that. I can get back to you on that. Okay. Um, this doesn't look like a question. Removing leaves. I have long leaves. I have long let leaves over winter. However, when I spoke to the CCE Master Gardener instructor, I was told that the leaves provide a cozy place for the deer ticks and so on over winter. And they will be awaiting our walk th through in spring. Lime is a real concern here. What do you suggest? So to me, um, I've never actually heard that and maybe I'm missing something, maybe I'm misinformed, but um, I think the barberry plant um, is a bigger threat to, um, you know, for ticks because studies have actually been done on Japanese barberry, which is a very common landscape plant. It is still sold in nurseries. Um, and there's been studies done that, that, that um, mice that live under these barberries, for whatever reason, the humidity level under the barberries, the mice living under the barberries have a higher concentration of ticks on them than mice living under, I don't know, another a rhododendron or a sweet shrub or something like that in your garden. Um, with the leaves, I mean, Maybe it's really thick layers of leaves. Again, remove your leaves from around your house and from around your walkway. Uh, leave the leaves in the spring, I mean in the fall, but in the spring do remove most of them. Leave a few that are already decomposing and rotting around at the base of plants to kind of com continue to decompose. I'm not saying to leave the entire leaf layer there in your beds all year. Remove the majority, leave some to continue the, the uh, decomposition. Larry says, I have at least two huge wasp nests high up in the trees. I think they are white face wasps. I don't think that's a question, but um, any response to that? 
So if they're high up in the trees, you That's know, as long, it is my understanding that as long as you don't put yourself in their direct line of flight, when they come out of the wasp nest, you will be fine. One of my clients in Woodstock had um, two, one on a smoke bush by where she parked her car and one hanging off of her shed. And she left them there and I learned something from her. And she said, Karen, you just have to stay, don't park your truck. She pointed it out to me. She's like, park away from the opening to avoid being in their line of flight. If you start getting in their line of flight, look out. But, um, you know, and also that changes if they build in a location where if you have small children, where there might be an obvious harm to you, but um, uh, from experience, from recent experience with my client, um, I would leave them, in, especially if they're high up in a tree. Uh, Muriel says, I have non-native plants which want to be there. Should I keep them? Uh, I need more information, like what type of non-native plants that want to be there. Okay, let's see if Muriel types in. What are the best plants for early spring? Ask Linda. I would say willow, definitely. Uh, pussy willows are, you know, they're silvery now and they're the first ones to actually bloom. And I actually asked Francis Groters of Catskill Native Nursery this question just a couple of weeks ago. You know, I said, is it just the native pussy willow that is such a pollinator um, plant? And, she, and he goes, no, all willows are good for pollinators. So if you have like the weeping willow, right? That's a common one. That's good. The pussy willows are great. Some of the more ornamental ones, the black willows, the black pussy willows, um, they're all good. Um, early season also again the lawn like things that are cropping up in your lawn it's the clovers it's the it's the dandelions even though dandelions aren't native um, but they're the ones that are going to start feeding your bees wow there's lots of questions um are the white face hornets pollinators asked larry that's a good question larry i don't know i would need to get back to you on that i know wasps are hornets considered wasps i'm not sure but there are wasp species that are considered pollinators. And there are wasp species that are also considered gentle and non-dangerous. And I believe Sam Droge, you should check out, find him on Facebook or his website at the US Geological Survey and ask him. Ross asks, I have a lot of invasive jumping worms and they seem to impact lots of the native plants. Any ideas? Yeah, the, the native jumping worms is something we've just come across in the last few years, and it's mostly down in your neck of the woods down there in Woodstock, up, you know, Mount Tremper. Um, other than them being kind of gross when we're down there <laughs> and scary and something like out of Alien, uh, no, I, I, I don't have any suggestion for that yet. That is something I need to do some more research on. Yeah. Um, do you recommend any plants for shady wet spots, asked Ruben. Yeah, winterberry is a good one. Um, it depends on how much shade, if it's in the middle of the woods and it doesn't get a lot of light at all. Um, there's not a whole lot to do there. But if you get even some sun, then there's button bush, then there's willows, then there's uh, winterberry, uh, shrub dogwood. Also, we've planted shrub dogwood in part sun, part shade, literally in a like a swampy area where we dug the hole and the water filled up and we just put the dogwood in and it's doing great. Can you say anything about loose strife plant for pollinators, asked Tricia. I don't know much about the loose strife plant for pollinators. So, so here's my experience with the loose strife. It is invasive um, and it can take over things. However, um, it is also beloved by many herbalists, you know, so no plant is all good or all, bla all bad. It probably offers support to pollinators. So maybe if you're gonna stay on top of it and you don't let it overrun the entire area and you stay on top of weeding most of her out and just keep a couple, go for it. And then also look up what the herbalists um, say about her, you know. Anne asks, what to do about a lawn which is overgrown with non-native grasses? I'd like to seed native flowers. Should I try to till it to give room? That's a good question. I would probably need to see the lawn first. Um, 
my experience with meadows and seeding like that have been going in on um, job sites where there was excavation work done. So all the topsoil had been removed, like you saw, it's just been clay and hard pan. So we didn't have to worry about the grasses. And then we sowed seed mix and we had success. With um, my own personal lawn turned into a meadow, you know, um, there's meadow grasses in there and, 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 and little like clovers and things like that that are now growing. And the asters came out after year three and goldenrods are coming out um, the longer I stopped mowing. But uh, I've also thought about possibly in your case, if you want to till a strip or two or three strips within your lawn and seed that strip, right? And then with the idea behind that is that the uh, native seeds that grow in the, in the tilled strip would then start cross, cross pollinating, cross moving into the other meadow area. The danger is of course, also those other non-native grasses could go in there. So that is something to maybe call Prairie Moon Nursery about or go onto their website because they have an in-depth document about how to create um, meadow and meadows and prairies. They will tell you to put down herbicide or smother it somehow. So that's my suggestion. Um, Muriel says, what is the least offensive but most efficient way to deal with deer? Yeah, that's a problem for you down there. Um, plant things that they don't like to eat, really. Uh, scented, scented things. Um, some landscapers will tell you you have to put a deer fence around. If you have the budget for that, put a deer fence around your whole property, then you won't worry. For many people, that is not uh, an appealing aesthetic option, nor is it a financial option. So really, mountain mints, um, sweet ferns, the shrubby St. John's wort, like things, uh, boxwood, they're not native, but you can stick a boxwood shrub here and there and, you know, for an interesting look, for contrast. So really just research plants that are strongly scented, right? Um, alliums too, onions. They tend not to like things that are strongly scented or very fuzzy too. They have fuzzy leaved plants. They tend to stay away from that. Linda asks, should we remove Creeping Charlie in flower beds and are strawberries native? I don't think, I'm not sure about the strawberries, but there's a, there's a, um, there is a, there is a native strawberry like ground cover that, um, that doesn't produce strawberries that um, uh, is useful. Um, the Creeping Charlie is, you know, that's up to you. If it's overrunning everything, you know, maybe remove it, maybe keep some of it. It is a ground cover, it's free right now. If you're transitioning from mulch to more of a herbaceous ground cover mulch layer, a green mulch layer, keep it and work with it. Again, just stay, you know, make sure, um, you can always edit Creeping Charlie out where you don't want him. Like why remove the whole thing if it's, you know, if you can work with him somehow. Andrew asks, we would like to hire a landscape consultant to help us in West Hurley. Is Karen available? Do you have Karen, any other recommendations? Yes, in the handouts, I, I do provide a list of local uh, landscape companies and nurseries that can provide that service. Teresa asks, will native meadow garden attract yellow jacket ground nests? I am allergic. That's another good question. I don't know. Have I ever come across, you know, the, the two ground nests that I've come across of those yellow jacket bees have both been up against a structure, a house. One was in West Hurley. No, one was in Hurley and the other one um, was down by, by Rhinebeck. I've never come across one just digging around in the garden or in a meadow, but I don't go digging in my meadow. So I can't really answer that. That's something to look up online. Anne asks, what's the best way to deal with overgrown lawn grass? I want to seed with natives. Should I turn the soil? Seems like we just sort of asked that question over again. You know, it would be- Did I, did I already ask that one? Yes, yes you did. Okay. <laughs> Stuart asks, what about tent caterpillars? They look destructive on the shrubs. So this is something they get in contact with Catskill Native Nursery about because they, there are tent caterpillars and then there's a different type of caterpillar that 
looks like a tent caterpillar and does the same sort of tenting netting thing on trees, but it's actually not the tent caterpillars and they're not that destructive. And they don't, if you notice with the tent caterpillars, they come in and it's like an infestation and they cover everything and everything drops its leaves. But with these little native guys, you'll see it on like one tree here, one tree a couple of miles down the road. But again, get in touch. I don't know enough about that. Get in touch with Catskill Native Nursery. They'll be able to help you with that. Okay, when you referred to the herbalist, who or what were you referring to? Oh, probably herbalists. Yeah, so, you know, different plant people look at plants differently, right? So the, um, so herbalists, uh, so like mugwort, right? Everyone's familiar with mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. It, it colonizes and takes over disturbed sites, construction sites. It's alongside Route um, 212 going from Woodstock to Saugerties right before South Peak, it's on the right side, you know, um, and it's considered a noxious weed by gardeners, right? Probably by native plant people too. But herbalists use mugwort for plant medicine. That's what I'm talking about. So purple loosestrife to gardeners and ecologists probably is considered an invasive and a bad plant. However, if you're an herbalist and you're looking at it as plant medicine, it's not a bad plant. So it depends on your perspective. That's what I meant. And it's helpful to look at plants from different perspectives. So it's not even Japanese knotweed, it's not all bad because it does provide late season food for the bees when it blooms. And then also there, it has, it has an attribute that is helpful to combat Lyme disease. And again, a doctor or an herbalist would be able to speak to that more than I can. But um, I often throughout the year when I have time, I go to various, I, I go and hang out with herbalists and I listen to what they have to say because they bring a whole new perspective to plants, which helps me in my gardening. And now I have a little stand of mugwort. It's not in a cultivated bed, but it's out by my fire pit and I'm keeping the mugwort because of what um, Marguerite Ullman Bauer um, conveyed to me. Sean asks, can you recommend ideal planting conditions for ornamental grasses? My soil is too rocky. I was using potting soil in a mound to promote growth. A lot of ornamental grasses like rocky, dry, inhospitable conditions like prairie drop seed is one. What I would recommend is hopping online to one of those mail order nurseries like Prairie Moon Nursery and seeing if they have plugs, a plant plug is a little, it has roots about this big, maybe two inches, three inches, it's very tiny. Um, and then plant those plugs in the existing soil. Do not, I mean, you can mound up a little, but don't create a volcano. Um, also add compost to the little hole that you're digging, but plugs in rocky, barren soil, plugs make all the difference, unless you're bringing an excavator in to dig out your hole, that's a whole different story. But little plugs, use compost and, um, Yes, there are some ornamental plants that will thrive in your um, condition. Also, sweet fern will thrive, and so should shrubby St. John's wort. That contemporary meadow landscape I showed you was dry, rocky, inhospitable soil. We just used the soil that was there and amended with compost, but we also had an excavator, so we cheated a little bit. Marilyn says, <clears throat> I like the idea of not using much mulch. Could I use a thin layer of leaves as mulch? Yeah, I think so, especially leaves that have started decomposing and rotting. You can start like a leaf compost pile. That uh, When I was doing my internship at Wave Hill in the Bronx, they had an enormous, oh my God, oh my God, this, this pile of leaves was, it was like a small building and it stunk to high heaven. It was rotting leaves, but we used that a lot as mulch in various beds. Ruben asks, how do you deal with Japanese beetles? I handpick them. Also, if you're growing things like grapes, which they like, plant a trap crop of like Virginia creeper nearby because they do like Virginia creeper and they'll go eat the Virginia creeper. Trap crops, that's something to look up online. Krista asks, I live in Mount Tremper, Phoenicia, slash Phoenicia. I have so much shade, lots of pines, moss and ferns. Hostas and astilbe do great. Will the mountain mint do well? 
there's there's five different mountain mints that um, I've been able to obtain via uh, wholesale nurseries and Catskill Native Nursery. And they're different mountain mints for different conditions. Some like more dry, some like a little more moist, some can handle some more shade. Again, it depends on the amount of shade. If you're talking about really heavy, deep shade, no, they won't work there. But there's a couple of asters, like white wood aster, and there's a goldenrod too um, that works in shade. I've seen it growing in the middle of the woods, um, but mountain mints need some dappled sun. Cynthia asks, I noticed Rosa Virginia, is it Virginiana? Virginiana Correct. Yeah. Is, uh, in one of the landscapes in your slides, isn't that considered an invasive? No, you're thinking of the other rose, the um, multiflora rose is considered invasive because it's not native. Came, I think, from England where they use it as hedgerows. And here, um, oh my God, the moment it set root, you know, like a branch set, sets root in the soil, it sprouts a new shrub. I've also seen it send tendrils up into trees where we've had to pull out, it turned into almost like a vine. So it's the multiflora rose. Virginia rose, at least up here, is not invasive. Okay, Ross says, um, did you get my question about the invasive jumping worms and any plants that might be resistant to them? We are infested with them in the yard and garden and woods. Yes, I believe we addressed the Japanese, uh, the jumping worm and I don't have an answer for you on that. I need to do some more research and um, maybe asking the Cornell Cooperative Extension or an agricultural extension might be your best bet because they're probably doing research on it, I bet. Gail asks, what can be planted in an area that is sometimes very wet, but dries out after a period of no rain? Things like the Joe pie weed, uh, the rose milkweed, some of those shrubs that like moist feet, but can also handle dry spells that, you know, they would work to willows, you know, willows here when they're growing along excuse me, the sides of the roads in, in, in ditches that are wet in the spring and the winter. And then again, oh my God, excuse me. Um, you know, when we have those three weeks of no rain or whatever, they, they don't get rain and, they, and they're still, you know, thriving and, and doing fine. Ross asks, I have some lulls in my pollinator plants. At some points during the summer, not many are flowering. Is that a big problem for the pollinators? I don't know if it's a big problem because it depends on what you're surrounded by. If you're surrounded by other gardens or um, native wild landscapes, they'll have food. But ideally, yes, you would like to keep things blooming all season from spring through early summer, through midsummer, through late summer, through fall. And that's where things get tricky. And that's where you're going to do research and learn and you're going to become a really good gardener for pollinators. These are some questions that came in before the um, webinar started. Climate change. What do we know about how this is changing our definition of native in Region 5? Who locally is knowledgeable about this? I'd say any landscaper that works with native or ecological horticulture, like, like uh, Diane and Francis at um, Catskill Native, or Maya at HarmonyScape, or Mel at Zone 4, anyone that's involved or even just, you know, a, a, a astute knowledgeable landscaper, they will know about that, you know, and it's not so much, it's, it's, it's about the extremes with the climate chaos. It's like the cold gets really, really cold and the warm gets really hot. Like I'm in West Kill, Spruceton Valley, um, West Kill Brewery for, to, to give you guys a location. And last year we had almost a whole week of the, and the year before that of a hundred degrees up here, 100 in zone four, elevation 2,300 feet. That's unheard of. Um, it used to be maybe a day of 90s. So the extremes are getting more. So those plants have to handle the extremes. Um, and, that's, and that's where native plants come in because um, they're going to adapt to that better because they're just growing out there wild and natural. Uh, many of us have established gardens with a mix of non-natives and natives. I hope the process of transitioning will be addressed. How do we prioritize what we need to pull out 
as well as what we need to plant. With pulling out, I'd be careful. I mean, if you have something invasive like a barberry or a burning bush, consider pulling it out. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, maybe move some things around and then add those four natives, the aster, the goldenrod, the mountain mint, and I'm forgetting one more, but um, you know, go, go like that. You don't have to rip everything out, but start with the invasive ones and then add like those top four native ones. Did we address this question? What are the best native flowers for early and mid spring? No, that's a really, well, sort of, it was willows and um, anything that's popping up in your lawn, dandelions, um, clovers, um, alliums start blooming, like those globe master alliums there in um, end of May, I think. So those would work too. There's more information on that online too. Um, I think we have time for a few more. What are the best, no. How can I install a pollinator garden using deer resistant plants or other protective measures? Well, the deer resistant plants are a good start. Uh, protective measures, you can always spray with like deer off or liquid fence. Also, I'm experimenting now and I think Doug Tallamy um, broached this topic in one of the books, not the current one, but the one before that, where he planted some ornamental grasses, some taller ones as a screen to a section of the garden that had more deer taste, you know, plants that were pal palatable to deer. And the deer came across the native uh, ornamental grasses first, which they never eat. Also ornamental grasses are deer proof, deer resistant. So the deer hit that first and they got lazy and they didn't try and go around or through the ornamental grasses to get to that other. So, um, I'm gonna start experimenting with that and put plant a lot of different size ornamental grasses. I'm doing a hedgerow right now for a client in Shokan. And we're putting in things like elderberry and roses, both of which the deer do browse. Um, they don't decimate, but they do browse. So we're putting in, in strategic locations, we're putting like the cloud nine ornamental grass that gets big six, six to seven foot tall. We're putting those in and around those other shrubs in, a, in the hopes that the deer will be like, eh, we don't want to deal with ornamental grasses right now. We'll go somewhere else. Okay. Yep. Um, let's call this our last question. Sean asks, is there anything that will choke out the invasive Japanese stilt weed? Ah, the stilt grass. One of my favorite topics lately. Uh, we, I've been trying for a couple of years with the help of some of my really dear, dear clients who have open minds about this and who also have stilt grass that they abhor. We've been um, uh, staging the battle of the plants, of the aggressive plants uh, and using mountain mint from seed by just sowing the seed in the stilt grass. And there's actually a property in Woodstock again, um, where after three years from seed, the mountain mints have now started to appear and they're spreading. So depending on budget, you could buy plugs of mountain mint, small containerized plants, um, or even regular mint, which is way more invasive than the mountain mints, and you know, see who wins. And um, I'm guessing that the mountain mints will win because they're taller than the stilt grass and they'll start shading it out and just smothering it because mint plants have, have, have really um, thick matted root systems um you know it's what you're comfortable with it's up to your comfort zone like if you want to put in culinary mint to do battle go for it know that at some point you're probably going to have a field of culinary mint but at least the mint is edible to you and the flowers the pollinators love so is it as bad as stilt grass me personally i don't think so because it offers benefits to humans and pollinators and the stilt grass does neither but again, it's up to your comfort level. I would not recommend that as a broad, broad solution. But yes, we're working on it just by trial and error. Hello? Okay, I can't hear anyone anymore. Um. Oh, there you are. I Thank can't. you so, so much. I've been uh, muted because um, 
that's the end of the question session. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Karen, for that beautiful and informative presentation. And thanks to all of you who logged into this webinar. I hope that you're better able now to imagine beautiful gardens for your property with enhanced wildlife habitat. And please consider joining the Woodstock Pollinator Pathway if you haven't already. Good evening, and thank you.